Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which is the two forms of relief that the federal government provides to individuals and couples. Joining me once again is my co-host, Jesse Barrantes. Jesse, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Dave. Nice to be here. Great to have you again. And our special guest, Bernice Burns from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome, Bernice. Thank nice. you. Bernice, we're going to be talking about the different chapters. We're going to come back to you and get some insight because you know people who have filed, you work with people who have filed, and it's important to hear how people have gone through the process and come out and what their life is like after. Okay, uh, but okay. let's start, Jesse, with Chapter 13, which is the less common chapter, but very important in many cases. Talk a little bit about what Chapter 13 is all about. Chapter 13 is a consolidation or a partial repayment. Um, usually people who have uh, or not otherwise eligible for the fresh start for Chapter 7, uh, and those are generally people who are trying to save a home or an auto in default, um, or even people who don't meet the requirements because they make too much money. A lot of times people will talk about uh, going and, and hiring one of these companies for consolidation. That's a mistake because Chapter 13 is federal, and so the creditors have to uh, have to abide by what those what those rules are. If somebody, for example, in, in a Chapter 13 is trying to save their house, basically what happens is the amount that they're behind that they owe, it's that amount that goes into the the bankruptcy that gets to repaid. In that Chapter 13, the debtor is required to pay back all of his secured creditors 100% within 36 or 60 months. And his unsecured creditors, as little as 10 cents on the dollar, all the way and up, I've seen, to 100% based upon that duration of time. Okay, so the situation that you're talking about with the mortgage, that would be utilized to save a home that's in foreclosure, stop a sale date. That's correct. And otherwise repay your mortgage over time. Uh, but I think it's key to note that you have to make the regular mortgage payment after filing plus that arrearage portion is the part being paid through the trustee. But it does mandate that the mortgage company accept those payments and you're able to save your home over a three to five year period, which really is a lifesaver as opposed to losing your home with possible equity. Well, it is, especially if you do have equity. Uh, there's a lot of situations where uh, people are, are upside down, and I mean, that affects just uh, you know hundreds and probably thousands of Americans because of the crisis that we've had. But if you're really that much underwater in your house, uh, and I realize there's, there's not, nothing like real estate, it's your home. You've grown up there, you need a place to live. However, it's important that you really consider that because if, if you're underwater by fifty or a hundred thousand dollars, you're you're really not going to recoup that value, and you really really want to think then about hey, just letting the property go. It would sort of be like me giving you a, a, a exchanging a dollar bill for a hundred dollar bill. Would it would if I give you a dollar bill, would you give me a hundred dollar bill? No. Well, I, well, I would do it all day long, right? If we could right. do that, and, and because it doesn't make any sense, so that's the same kind of thing. But still, people continue to do that, and once they've done that, they might be able to. Once you file a Chapter 13, you could still file a Chapter 7 if you're eligible and and and, and get rid of the property later on down the line. But you know, again, it's really something that that people need to consider. Right, now, Bernice, you're aware of people who are struggling to stay in their home. They receive the foreclosure summons. They might not have gone to court for several months. They're kind of burying their head in the sand. Um, from what you've seen, when is the best time to get some help? I mean, there the red flag is ASAP. Hmm. You know, that's right. Uh, and uh, it's really nothing to give a second thought about because it's uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. You see that you're not going to get above, so. Your best option is to go and, you know, talk to an attorney, try to get into a bankruptcy. Yeah, she hit it right on the head. Some people wait too long, Jesse, and then what happens is the arrearage portion builds up, which means their monthly plan payment to cure it goes, goes up, as, up well. as well. So the quicker you can catch the problem, uh, the more likely you are to be able to solve the problem. And also, if you blow the deadline, if it already goes to a sheriff's sale, if it's already been auctioned away, then, then, then Chapter then 13 it, is not an option anymore. You have, in fact, lost your home right. at that point. The only thing you can do is wipe out the debt. You're not going to be in a position to save it. So the Chapter 13 for a home is possible uh, if you get it before a sheriff's sale. Right, you know, and, and there's a, and I actually just had a client this past weekend uh, who came in and was, uh, <laughs> they're, they're up to date on everything, 
but they're going to lose it. Very clear because of everything that's going on. All right, and uh, they called the uh, the lender to try to get some relief. And you know exactly what I'm going to tell both of you because again, you work do the same thing in in that business. And and they told them, well, you're you're not you're not far enough behind. And, and I can't, for the life of me, figure this out. Uh, I get that there's room for abuse, but. <laughs> Don't we want to try to save this before I get into trouble? Basically, what you're telling me is don't pay me for the next three months, and then maybe you'll qualify. It yeah. sounds crazy to me. Well, it's like a landlord. If they have a tenant that's making the monthly payment on time each month, and then they get the phone call from the tenant saying, can you drop my rent 100 I'm really struggling. I'm not making as much. Uh, the landlord's going to probably say no because you've always made the payment. So there has to be a breach. There has to be a default. There has to be some honesty involved where a lender or a landlord will finally say, okay, I see there's a problem here. Let's see if we can work it out. Or they might not want to work it out. They might want to, they might want to get the property back and get someone else in there who can uh, pay the rent or sell the property right. in a, a lender situation. Let it go. Dave, uh, we were talking about Chapter 13. So a uh, couple questions that, that... How much does a Chapter 13 cost? What's the procedure to get it going? Well, the actual filing fee with the federal government as of this taping is $310 for a Chapter 13. That's money that goes right to the clerk of the U.S. Bankruptcy Court. Uh, you can get a waiver if you qualify, but I haven't seen it in a Chapter 13. So plan on paying $310 just for a filing fee, and then the attorney's fees can vary. Uh, but the typical standard fee in this area is $4,000 total over the life of the case. So you don't pay $4,000 down. Uh, the attorney gets paid a little bit per month as you're making your monthly payments to a trustee. And that's capped by the federal law in terms of the amount? Uh, it's ca capped by the local rules right. here. The, uh, the judges in the Northern District of Illinois have uh, adopted what they call the model retention agreement, which says how much attorneys can be paid on a flat fee basis. There are attorneys who can charge hourly, and if they can justify it, they can uh, earn more. But uh, I'd say 95% of all the attorneys who practice bankruptcy adopt the model retention agreement as part of their practice because it's just easier and it's a fair fee. What are the kind of things that, that you need? You help people with this, uh, right, Bernice, in terms of get, you know, people to get their, their documents together that they, they'd need. For Chapter 13, what, what do you need in terms of documents? You need tax returns, of course, I would yeah. think. Yeah. Bernice, you can speak to years, this. The last four years of your tax return, and you would also need uh, 60 days of paycheck stubs. You know, these are things that they have to come in uh, with in order to uh, if they wanted to get their case filed ASAP. And uh, another thing that they would need is uh, uh, the, the, the uh, fee so that they can pay the, uh, uh, not the attorney fees, pay the, the filing fee, and they're going to also have to take a credit counseling class. That's something that they have to take up front, too, before their case can be filed. Now, that's a precursor, right, the, the, the filing uh, or the class? It's a prerequisite for any case filed, 7 or 13, in the country. Uh, it's just one of those things that the government says you have to go through. What happens if I take the class the day after you file my case? Then your case is not valid, right. and it will be dismissed. It's, it's as if you never filed in many jurisdictions because you haven't taken the pre-filing credit counseling. The theory behind the pre-filing credit counseling, as far as the legislature was concerned, when they mandated this in uh, October of 2005, the hope was that people would take the credit counseling and then opt to repay their creditors a different way, not utilizing the bankruptcy laws. However, that was just a, uh, a red Hi, herring yep, yep. because in reality, most of the people, 99% of them, are being referred to credit counseling by their bankruptcy attorney because it's a prerequisite. So it's become a cottage industry. It's been a moneymaker for the credit counseling companies. It's put the debtors through another hoop making it a little more difficult to file than it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. But it's not stopping anybody from filing. It's just another requirement that has to be added to the list to get the relief. There's also a debt management course after that, correct? Yeah, that's the uh, financial management, the uh -huh. two-hour financial management. Um, Bernice, you've seen the course. Do you want to talk briefly about what it's about? The, uh, the, uh, you have to watch a DVD, you know, and they ask you questions and... You have to answer those questions, and then when you go to your creditors' meeting, you uh, can either bring that DVD back with you, and uh, the, the um, questions that they answer can be come through the email back to the law firm after they've, uh, you know, completed watching this. 
What are some of the topics that are covered in that two-hour class? Oh, well, I, I, I honestly forgot because it's been a while okay. since well, I've taken that. The government would not be out. happy to hear that you forgot, but mm -hmm. it's everything <laughs> from budgeting to mm -hmm. purchasing a car to insurance to mortgages to protecting your identity, okay, making sure you yeah. shred stuff because people can steal your Social Security number out of your garbage can <laughs> and your other bills. And, and So it's all about being smart financially. And the theory there, the hope was that by having someone take a two-hour class, they would never be in financial trouble again. <laughs> well, is there oh, is wow. there any truth to that? That's what I, I mean, <laughs> no. how many people, you've seen that, you've seen other people, you mentioned that just on the last show, I think, uh, come back after having filed, after and having they've, they've taken the same class. Yeah. And they've taken that, I mean, take, you take that class, you went through the uh, uh, financial, watching the, the movie and answering questions and, I mean, I mean, it's a long, boring process. Then, don't you know? And then you go out and do this again. I'm like, it was irrelevant to, to watch this. I mean, how many people are gonna buy by those rules? Come on, uh, Jesse. I mean, it, that's just something you're telling the federal government. Yeah, I'm gonna do this because right now I'm anxious to get out of this situation that I'm in. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> for some people it's have beneficial, it. but for most people, Jesse, it's just another exercise that they have to complete. And another cost, right? Another cost, not not a tremendous cost, but it's a time cost. Yeah. You're, yeah. Uh, as I recall, you're one of the few attorneys that's an accredited provider of that course. Right. We provide the uh, DVD, and our clients can watch it in their, in the comfort of their home, and some of them actually do, you know, pick up some information. And they're grateful for it. But for most people, you're not going to learn in two hours anything that's going to necessarily change the way you've been living your life. Uh, it, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to actually learn how to budget and to be careful about uh, your finances. It's not something you learn in two hours. Um, to get good at anything, Jesse, you have to do it a lot. I mean, you cook a lot, you're a great cook. You can't bring in someone who, who never cooked into your home and in two hours, you know, make them Julia Child. It's just not gonna happen. No, can teach them how to dice onions, maybe. <laughs> yeah, they can wash your dishes. That's what they can do for you in two oh, hours. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. All right, Jesse, let me ask you this. Sure. Um, what percentage is typically paid back in a Chapter 13 if someone only has credit card debt? <clears throat> typically, uh, it's going to be somewhere around 10%, and there's a range. It gets between 10 to 100%, depending upon your the money that you have available after your allowable expenses. And I say after your allowable expenses, it's not what you actually spend on it. It's what the federal government has deemed to be allowable. Uh, just for example, the government um, allowable expenditure for food for one person is three fifty, and then fifty dollars for each additional person. Now, I'm not quite sure how you can somebody can live on one person can live on three hundred and fifty bucks. I don't care if you go to Aldi or, or wherever you go, uh, which is a good place, but uh, three hundred fifty dollars just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of money unless you're living on ramen. You know, mm -hmm. um, so right. so you're, have, not, you're not eating healthy at that either. You might be eating a lot of fast food. True. Mm -hmm. For that kind of budget, right? And so when you go through when you go through those expenses that are allowable, and you have uh, you know for either for your rent or for your mortgage, for um, oh association fees, water, garbage, heat and electric, those kinds of things, um, gas and tolls for your car, um, of course uh, you've got laundry and dry cleaning, you've got you know prescription medication, your insurance, mm -hmm. life insurance, child care or tuition, car payments or lease payment, uh, those type of things that, uh, that come out, charitable contributions, but only if you've been making the charitable contributions before, because again, in Chapter 13, they're going to look and they're going to say, all of a sudden, somebody got religion and now, hey, you've never paid anything before, now you're paying $1,000 a month. Okay, it's not yeah. going to happen that way. The trustees are asking for proof right. of tithing. Right. You have to have to be able to show that proof. And then, uh, in order to be, to, el to be eligible for Chapter 13, after you go through all those allowable expenses based upon what your income is, and they also include the income of your spouse, whether or not he or she is filing. But you can also include those expenses as well. Now, there's a threshold based upon how many people are in the household as to whether or not they can actually file a chapter, well, chapter 7, chapter 13. Um, but uh, when, when you look at what, you know, what the expenses are from both people and then you know, their liability, a lot of times you know, one spouse doesn't work in any event. So again, chapter 13, you have to pay back 100% 
of your secured creditors. So if you have a car and you owe twenty thousand dollars, where does that go, Bernice? That goes in the kitty, in right? The kitty, yeah. All right. So that's got to be uh, paid back. And then you've got your credit cards. Let's say you've got fifty thousand in credit cards. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, ten percent of fifty thousand is five thousand. Five grand, or or any. Uh, you know, sliding increment in between there based upon what the plan payment is. But again, right. it's 36 or 60 months. Okay, and I asked you about percentage, but in reality, clients want to know how much they're going to have to pay per month. Right. They're really not overly concerned with whether it's 10%, 20%, 80%. It's whether or not that dollar figure that was quoted to them that they're going to be required to pay for the next three right. to five years is something they can readily afford. Now, and Bernice, you've seen all kinds of different plan payments, but what are some of the plan payments that you've seen that, that are really quite beneficial to people who are in debt? What dollar amounts have you seen as a payment plan? I've seen like $500, uh, which is a, a, a month, you know, and, and that's, that's pretty reasonable, you know, uh, paying back for, for a period of three to five years because that person, that individual get paid like twice a month. I mean, you know, twice out of a month. And if you think about it, I mean, it, it's a great help because it's not $500 every pay period, you know, opposed to that could be a, uh, uh, I mean, that could be a big uh, thing, whereas it, you can't afford that, mm -hmm. you know. And the 500 might include the person's car in there. Right. If they don't have a car, you, you've seen plan payments as low as $100 a month. $100, that's true. Just for, the, know, for the unsecured. And that holds off the creditors. It stops the collections. Exactly. You don't have to go to court on a, on a credit card debt exactly. for 100 a month. I know, I know an individual just came to the uh, law firm, and he was so pleased because his car payment was like $548 just alone for his car payment. Now, his plan payment, he just got into a Chapter 13. He was so thrilled. I mean, so excited that his car payment and his uh, his uh, payment plan for the cha bankruptcy chapter thirteen mm -hmm. was less than five hundred and forty eight dollars. I mean, come on, you got a that was your car note. Now you got your credit cards mm -hmm. included in your those hospital bills, those payday loans, and he was <clears> just he couldn't believe it. He yeah, it was sounds just like the so reason, excited, you know. It sounds like the reason why the plan payment was what it was is because of the stretch of five years was able to reduce the amount he was paying on his car because his car payment was uh, originally less than a five-year deal. Sure. And, you know, it goes the other way. I, I've seen people that come in and, and you know, again, they, they're at a different income level. And because, again, with the, with the Chapter 13, um, if your car payment is 500 bucks, you know, it, include that because you know that gets put in the in the bankruptcy so you know you've got an extra 500 bucks or whatever so sometimes their their plan payments are going to be somewhere around you know 1500 I've even seen a couple thousand and uh, and then people get um, sometimes uh, again the other end of this excited because oh I you know well then I, I could pay my you know my debt myself and then I always look at him and say okay well but you haven't yet, okay? Right. But also the important thing is there's no interest, there's no penalties, and guess what? You know, by the time you come out of this, uh, you're going to be okay. If it's a 100% plan, meaning that after you come out of it with the, you know, 36 or 60 months, that all your creditors are going to be paid back 100%. And that happens sometimes because of just the amount of income that these people have. Okay. Because Chapter 13 is slim living. However, if it's going to be a 100% plan, sometimes the trustee will allow you to pay a smaller amount for a greater duration so that you have a little bit of a buffer. Now, I can tell you that if it's not a 100% plan, the, the trustee is going to make you do all, you know, a couple things. One of the things I've seen a lot is if you have a voluntary contribution to your retirement, uh, the trustee is going to say, nope, you're not going to pay that. That's going to be suspended until the duration of the plan. Yeah, you also might lose your tax refund if you're not paying back 100%. Exactly. That gets paid into the plan, too, as a supplemental payment. So that means that they're going to have to pay that after the bankruptcy is over with. Is that what you're saying? You know, they're going to have to pay that after their uh, bankruptcy is over with, three to five years, they're going to still have to have a, a payment plan to pay those credits? Oh, credits? no, those everything, everything will be done. Okay. No, it's just that, you know, it, instead, of, uh, instead of having that slim living, if it's a 100% plan, you know what, they'll let you make it, you know, instead of having to pay three years, okay, they'll yeah. let you pay five years so that you have a little bit more money in your pocket because, again, it, it, it's pretty slim in terms of, you know, you have those allowable expenses, and that's what they're going to keep you to. Okay. Now, you mentioned the Chapter 13 amount is based on your income minus your expenses and, right. of course, repaying yep. your debt. 
What if circumstances change a year or two into your plan where all of a sudden you're making less per month or your expenses go up in terms of rent? Can you come back into court? Is there any kind of uh, modification that's possible under the law? Sure, you can go in to modify your plan based upon those changes and even sometimes you might even be able to go in in order to convert it into a Chapter 7. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. Okay, well, a conversion would be you're changing from Chapter 13 to Chapter 7. Uh, if you have a, a vehicle that you were saving in a 13 and all of a sudden you don't want to keep the vehicle, maybe it becomes in disrepair, it's not worth mm -hmm. it, um, you can sometimes convert to a Chapter 7 if you haven't done a Chapter 7 within eight years and if you don't have the income anymore to repay your debt, you could opt for the Chapter 7 relief, uh, which is the fresh start. Right. Um, so that, that's a good way to go. So what, excuse me, so what happens like, okay, if they convert to a Chapter 7 out of 13, set, is certain debts in that 13 that, that's not going to get discharged in the Chapter 7, such as parking tickets, correct? That's uh, true. Parking tickets, recent taxes, taxes child support, exactly. maintenance. Yeah, but child support is never dischargeable. Death and taxes, right? Okay. All right. Well, taxes, if they're old enough, we can discharge. Well, hey, what about that? A lot of people have those questions. So what, what's, what do you have to, and obviously that's, that's different. A Chapter 7 versus a Chapter 13 is different. So are you saying that um, if you qualify and you're doing Chapter 13, you're only going to have to pay a portion of those taxes just to treat it like unsecured? Uh, right. The rule with taxes, it's a little bit compl complicated, but I'll just give you the, the basic. If a tax is more than three years old and you filed that return either on time or at least two years before filing, then the tax that is typically non-priority or unsecured, which means you can pay it back at less than in full. So you can pay it 10, 20, 30 percent, depending right. upon your case. If, on the other hand, it's a recent tax within the last three years, then that tax is a priority and it must be paid back 100 percent so in a 13. In a 13. So what happens in a 13 if I've got a tax debt that's recent of, you know, $50,000, but there's no way. So what happens? It gets paid back some of it until the bankruptcy, the Chapter 13 is done, and then I still owe the balance. Is that how that works, or I'm not going to be able to do a Chapter 13? You're not going to be able to do a Chapter 13 unless you can pay back 100% of those recent taxes. How about student loans? Do they work the same or different? Student loans are a little different. That's an unsecured debt, meaning it's not a government debt per se, or there's no security attached to it. It's not a tax debt, I should say. Um, in that case, you can pay less than what's owed on the student loan during the course of the bankruptcy. And then once the case is over, you are going to owe the remainder, the portion that wasn't paid through the 13, because it's a non-dischargeable debt. But you were able to treat that a little bit differently then you were that priority tax debt, which is important. Well, it, 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 uh, student loan is dischargeable under certain incredible circumstances. Right. There has to be a complete undue hardship. Um, that's a situation, in my opinion, where someone does not have the ability to work. They're either disabled, incapacitated, and in those situations, um, they were, the student loan wouldn't be able to collect any money anyway. So I haven't really seen a, a, a discharge Chapter 7 in all my years, so... Uh, uh, student loan, rather. Uh, plan on paying back your student loan or at least having it due and owing after your case is over. Well, the, the statute of limitations for a written contract is 10 years, right? So um, if there's no action, then? Well, it depends on the student loan. depends on the student loan. Uh, it, it differs from other types mm -hmm. of debts, such as credit card debts and things like that, which do last for 10 years. And if they're not renewed, uh, if the judgment is not renewed, if there's not activity on it, would be uh, eliminated, and if someone tries to collect on it, it's a phantom debt, and they could be uh, they could be sued. But for most people that owe money, the debt is right here. It's right now. They're being called on it. Um, they're being sued. They're being garnished. They're being harassed, and they need to take action now. Uh, otherwise, they're just going to have this vicious cycle of debt, never ending. Uh, you don't want to go in circles. You want to be able to find. Uh, relief, which is what bankruptcy is. It's protection. It's relief. It's there for a reason. And you want to go to an attorney who is experienced in bankruptcy mm -hmm. in not only Chapter 7 but Chapter 13 as well, so they're going to be able to let you know whether or not you're eligible and if you are for which chapter. And you want to be able to go to a firm that's going to be able to answer your questions. So if I call you, I, you know, I don't have to call on you know, a certain day of the week or whatever. When I call you, um, you're going to you know, answer the phone and let me know kind of What's going on? Oh, absolutely. You want to have uh, your attorneys be accessible. Uh, you want to be able to get quick answers to the questions. And you want to be able to feel that you can call and get your questions answered. 
Uh, there's a lot of firms out there where you're never going to talk to the same attorney. Uh, they're big outfits. We hear this all the time. I, I, I get no calls back. Uh, I can't talk to the guy that I met with or the woman that I met with. So you, you want to make sure that you're, you're doing a good service for people and providing answers and being accessible. Uh, and, and Bernice, you can speak to that. You've, you've gotten calls from people who have uh, done cases with other people and they've been uh, pretty much disgusted, which is why they're exactly, finding another law because firm. because they don't get uh, return phone calls. You know, they call to ask questions. And they was like, you know what? And they could sometimes have put down a down payment to the, you know, to the, to the company. It was like, is it any way I can uh, fire them and hire you guys, to, you know, to be my attorney? You know, I, I want to withdraw uh, from them because they're not treating me right. You know, they got my money now. They won't even return my phone calls, you know. And uh, a lot of times uh, they was like they first have to, I think, fire you that, that firm. And then, you know, you come. they come in for a consultation and we try to work with them from there. Yeah, I can't speak to anybody if they're already represented. Right, but if right. they actually terminate that other attorney um, and they do that on their own without any coercion or anything, then uh, I'm free to... Uh, pick up from there, but I want to make sure that they're no longer represented because that would be an ethical violation right. to deal with them at that point. But it's nice to have a personal touch to be able to talk to the same person, at least that's going to be taking care of uh, of your case, of your file. Exactly, because a lot of times people get comfortable with the, you know, the attorney that they met face to face and, you know, by me explaining it to the, a lot of our clients when they call in, I let them know that, you know, we have several attorneys here and they all basically work on the, you know, the same thing mm -hmm. so they can, uh, they all can ask a question. It's, you understand what I'm saying? It's not right. like, oh, this one don't know anything about my case or that one doesn't know anything about my case. You know, I let them know that we, the, all the attorneys there are pretty much uh, uh, working on the same, you know, the same thing, and they know just about everything when it comes to bankruptcy, sure. you know. And I got a question for you as well. Uh, does uh, bankruptcy, will it stop you from any way getting a job? You know, a lot of people call and they, they ask uh, questions like, uh, I, I got a job interview, or do you think this is going to come up? Sure. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. You know, truth be told is that, you know, people aren't going to know if you're doing a bankruptcy. You know, there is an exception. A lot of times the credit card company, um, there are people that ask, well, I have this credit card that, uh, you know, doesn't have any balance on it. I, can I continue to use it? Well, a lot of times the credit card companies are plugged in and so they know when you file a bankruptcy and so you know they'll they'll just cancel your account but when you're going to, uh, for an employer or uh, a job interview anything like that they're not unless you tell them they're not going to know i guess there is one other exception that if you do get the job and you're doing a, a chapter 13 and it's coming out of your yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's coming out of payroll right. you know yeah, it's a garnishment you know that way they'll know but you already have the job right. exactly so i know that's not really going to be relevant unless you unless you tell on yourself and i don't think that's really a question they should be uh, asking you exception though i mean i think if you're getting a financial job or a bank job you know it might become relevant yeah i think you're relatively safe with applying for a job and it's also for, the, for consumers out there who are watching, uh, do their homework. Uh, do your homework. Look, look on the reviews online. Um, look at some of the information that's published. Try and find out if that person has helped someone that you know and is reputable. So uh, uh, that's basically how we want to do it. For uh, Bernice, security. thanks very much for joining us. You've been oh, a, a wonderful guest. Thank you. Jesse, good to see you as well. Dave, you as well. I'm Dave Siegel. We'll see you next time on Legal Action. Take care. Good.